This is part two of a three-part series on the Essex hot air engine. Howdy again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and this is part two of my series on the Essex hot air Stirling type engine. And in part one, if you watched it, I explained uh, how I bought it and where it came from and what it is and uh, a few of the operational procedures about it. But since the last video, which was about three days ago that I actually made it, I've been working on it, trying to get it going, and I have been unsuccessful at this time and kind of discouraged. But let me explain everything that I've done on it in the regards to trying to get it running. And I actually will, again, show you a failure, which is pretty easy to do with this engine. And I, yeah, I am discouraged, but... Uh, I will stick with it. I am undaunted and uh, it will be fun, I think, if I don't get too mad. Otherwise, you can dig it out at the landfill in Pontiac. So let's get started. I'll tell you what I did with it. First of all, let me tell you that I just got back from an antique mall and that is an old Essex automobile. Do not confuse Essex automobiles with, which is that brand, with this engine. They have nothing whatsoever to do with each other. Well, the first thing I did with this engine the other day was to drain this tank, this cooling tank, and it holds two gallons, and in there was a mixture of antifreeze and water, about a 50-50 mixture. I actually tested it, and I didn't really need to drain it for that matter, but now at least I know what's in there because I put in fresh antifreeze, again 50-50, one gallon of this and one gallon of water. I did not use distilled water, I probably should have. In my ill-fated attempt to run this thing, I have used three kinds of fuel and the results is the same with all three of them. However, the kerosene K1 smells much worse than the others, especially when I come back into the garage the following day. But I have used denatured alcohol and I have used white gas, which is what Coleman fuel or any lantern fuel is, and that was at Walmart for five dollars. So currently in the tank I have kerosene or what is left of it but I have to work on this valve, probably put a new washer in it or whatever is in there because it is leaking and you can see that, or maybe you can't, that there is kerosene in the little pan down here that has leaked overnight, which also means that this valve that you're looking at apparently leaks just a little bit. That's the needle valve. Now in order to run the engine, you have to use either alcohol or whatever fuel you have down in here, but if you use kerosene, you need a wick. So that's kerosene that's in there right now, and I'll just poke that down in there, and you see it gets absorbed right away, and that will light very easily. But if you're using kerosene, again, you have to use a wick of some kind, but you do not with alcohol. So it really doesn't matter which one you're using. And for that matter, you can preheat this probably with your burns o propane torch. So now I'm going to go ahead and light this and I'll do the lubrication. I'm not going to put any oil into the oiler here because it's just going to all run through and it doesn't make any difference because you can see it will not run here. But I just want to show you how well it doesn't run. All right. So let me go ahead and light that up, and it takes three or four minutes, and a lot of soot, a lot of smoke, so that's objectionable if you're doing it indoors. It will not smoke like that with alcohol. And I don't remember, I don't remember if it smokes with the white gas, because I, I did so many different experiments here. So I'll be back with you in a couple minutes. Okay, now the generator is hot enough, and I'm going to turn the needle valve on a little bit, and you will see a flame. 
But I'm not satisfied at all with the way that performs because it's still shooting, I think, some liquid. Maybe it's not hot enough. You can see that it's shooting liquid kerosene underneath and all over the place. And normally, I like to put a piece of sheet metal under here. So the wooden table won't start on fire. Ideally, it should be a blue flame. Like my old Chevy Blue Flame 6. A lot of smoke coming out of the chimney. I believe there's a big soot buildup inside of the furnace here. That's called the furnace. This is called the furnace. And I got oil burning down here, so I need to clean that up. So it's kind of a mess. But I'm going to get it a little hotter. And then we'll see how well it doesn't run. You can always tell the direction of rotation of a Sterling. Well, you can tell by the way it's timed, which I don't want to talk about, but if you attempt to turn it the wrong way, you see it's not going to work at all. But it, you see it's trying to run, and either it's not hot enough or there are other issues, and I think there is a combination of issues. I did have it hot enough to where it seemed like it ran a lot better than what I'm showing you right now, but for illustration purposes, that's good enough so that you know that I need to work on it. So I'm going to turn off the burner. And now look at the flame coming out of the top. You know, none of that should happen. I have no idea why that's burning so violently out the chimney. Either excess fuel or, like I said, carbon and soot. And now it's dying down. And I have turned off the valve up there. Now I need to let it cool down a little bit so that I can work on it. But can you see that it was actually trying to run? Well, the first thing I thought of is there's something wrong with the needle valve or the orifice. So I'm taking the needle valve out. You can see what it looks like, just like any needle valve in any carburetor that you've seen over the years. So there's nothing wrong with that. But then I thought, well, maybe the orifice in there is clogged. So I did use my tip cleaners and there was no blockage. But what I'm thinking of is that well, we know that the orifice is not too small, but someone could have reamed it out. Bubba was here. You'll see later on that Bubba was here. So what I did is I measured the diameter, and a number 56 drill bit fits perfectly, and that's 46 thousandths. So the orifice is 46 thousandths. I do not, I have no idea if that is correct or close to being correct, but I'm just wondering why it's flaring up so much. And it's an unsteady flame rather than that nice blue flame that I just mentioned. All right, there's nothing I can do about that at this time, so I'm going to go ahead and put this back in, and then we're going to take the uh, power piston out. That's on on this end. That's the power piston. On the other end is the displacer and they are not connected with one another. They are two separate uh, items. Be back in a minute. On this side of the flywheel is a rod and the rod goes up here and moves the displacer back and forth. I've already explained that in the other video but I need to take that off. There's a cotter pin 
and that comes right off. Now I'll swing it around and there's three screws to remove. I've already removed one screw from the bottom and I had it hanging over the bench to do that and then there's two other screws here and that's all there is to taking off the flywheel and the main bearing if you want to call it that and I do so now this will come off and the piston will come out it's a nice looking piece isn't it six curved spokes beautifully crafted and this is the power piston and I'll have to admit I've had this out before and the connecting rod comes out very easily it's brass you look in there you can see the wrist pin it's only half of a wrist pin but here's what I do not understand at all first of all this looks cobbled up I've never seen one made like this so we've got an iron I believe this is cast iron and then it looks like somebody added this piece of brass on there and beat the heck out of it so Bubba has been at work and from the shininess right here and here I believe that it's rubbing so I'm gonna put some bluing on here later on and put it in there and see where it's rubbing and if I can possibly file that down because we can't have any resistance it has to be very free moving now let's have a gander inside the bore so I'll get that wiped out and be right back all right let's look down the bore now with the flashlight and at the very end down there what you're seeing is the end of the displacer I'll move it back and forth with my left hand and that just moves the hot air back and forth in there that's all that does and I'm not going to take that out at least not at this moment and I do not even know how to take it out but here is what I do not understand at all there is and you probably can't tell the color by the uh, by the film here there's no film but it appears that there's a brass sleeve in there can you see that and I have no idea if that is original or that's some crazy repair that somebody made the same as I don't understand the brass extension on that piston and I doubt if there's anyone watching this that can explain that to me furthermore it looks like it's dented or damaged in there can you see that it's very irregular in shape so I do not understand that at all but what I am thinking now is this a Stirling engine is pretty much a closed system that is when the piston is in here the air in there which sometimes might be called a fluid it is not allowed uh, to escape nor do we want any more air to come in there and some of the modern Stirlings use gases in there I don't know how that all works but some kind of gas probably inert gases I suppose but I believe there is a leak here either by caused by the heat or rust or I don't know what but if it isn't sealed it's not going to run ever until that is repaired or fixed or whatever welded sealed so I'm going to check now I'm going to do a little diagnosing diagnosis and check for a leak and the first thing I'm going to do is to put a little balloon over here well you'll see now what I'm doing here is I'm playing the heat against the main cylinder here or a little bit into the furnace whatever but I'm applying heat and on this end I put a rubber glove so that's kind of sealed it up now as I move the displacer back and forth can you see that you know it's acting like a diaphragm or what the piston is doing that it's pushing it and sucking it as I move the displacer back and forth but I believe there is a leak because there doesn't seem to be uh, much vacuum in there or much pressure at all I think that some air can leak out of the oiler so uh, later on in my experimenting I'm going to plug that with a with a pipe plug 
and see if it makes any difference. But this is still inconclusive. And why is there smoke in there? I don't believe there should even be any smoke inside the cylinder because it isn't all that hot. Now I'm going to do a vacuum check. I don't, my little mighty, what do you call it, mighty vac doesn't work. I had two of them, they're both broken. I need to throw them out. But this is a big two inch cork, this is a two inch bore, out of one of my scientific pieces of apparatus. And I put a piece of vinyl hose and I'm going to suck on this to create a vacuum. But first I will get a pretty good fit here that it's sealed off. And then I'm happy with that. Now I'm going to suck on this like a soda straw. Which I did off, you can't see me doing that, but I am not feeling much suction. You know how it should feel when you, when you suck on a tube or a pop bottle, you get, you get a vacuum. I'm not getting a vacuum, or not much. No. So there's a leak. Well, now I'm going to reverse the procedure and I'm going to blow in here, first with my mouth and then maybe with the compressor at just a few pounds. I don't need 50 pounds, I mean 2 pounds or 5 pounds. But when I blow on this right now, I am unable to pressurize it. So it's leaking someplace either through a hole or a damage or a burnout or it could be right here, or it could be my cork, and so that's inconclusive. And certainly there is probably always going to be some leakage right here on the rod that goes into the displacer. Although that's a darn good fit. So if there's any leakage there, it's, it will be minimal. And I'm not in the mood for taking the rod out of there and plugging that hole with a little cork, although I considered it, and I may do a lot of things off camera to try to determine where this leak is. Yesterday in my experimentation, which was rather extensive, I would sometimes get flames that would seem to burst out of here. And I don't know why there would be flames coming out of there. That makes no sense at all to me. I'm learning here as much as you are. I hope you're learning something. Okay, now look what I did. I took the drip boiler out, that's an eighth inch pipe thread, and I put in a plug, but that didn't seem to be doing the job because of the, there's not enough space here between the cooling fins, so I used that green cork that I had. Well, now, sucking on this, can you hear that? I'm getting a bit of suction. So there was a leak right there. Maybe that's it. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to leave that in there, and I'm going to change fuels. I'm sick of that stinking kerosene. So I'm going to take the fuel tank off, flush it, flush the pipe, get all the kerosene out of there, if there is any in there. And then I am going to uh, put in Coleman fuel. That's what I'm going to use. That is white gas, I should say. White gas. What do you think of that? And I did not pressurize this, although let me blow into it. Blowing into it, I feel that I am creating just a little bit of pressure. Well, I haven't repaired this yet. I assume there's a washer in there like any old faucet, I don't know. But I wanted you to see this two quart, it's about two quarts. The way this is concave here, I love it because in some ways you wouldn't even need a funnel to fill it. But in fact, even if you're using a funnel and you spilled a little bit, it's going to run in there. And then there's a beautiful brass knurled cap that goes in there. So. Just a lot of attention to detail years ago. And it's not rotted out, it's not rusted out, because it's brass. It's kind of timeless. It'll probably only last another thousand years. It's 15 minutes later, and this is white gas, 
and I'm not having much better results at all with the white gas. However, there's less smoke, or that is, not less smoke, less black smoke. But what I'm doing here now in this little phase of the video is, again, look at the green plug, so there should be no leaks right there. But now I'm going to move the displacer back and forth by hand and watch the piston. See, it's being pushed and pulled, and we got about, I'd say, a half inch of motion, which I don't think is enough for it to run. And when it comes out too far, you see I've lost the seal. That's five-eighths of an inch. I almost feel like putting it back together and trying it. I think I will. Alright, it's back together and notice that with the white gas I do have somewhat of a blue flame but I don't know why that orange flame keeps creeping in there and I'm fine tuning it with a needle valve. It doesn't seem to make much difference. Either there's too much or too little and I'm not real sure why there seems to be a, a fire inside the furnace. <laughs> Soot or oil, I'm not sure. Well, let's see if she kicks over now. I'm not sure it's quite hot enough. There's still some smoke coming out of the chimney. Some. Looks like a power plant. Boy, did some guy chew me out over my requests for information. Remember my plea? And I think I'll have to give him a refund on his money. Oh, that's right. He didn't pay anything. All right, let's see what happens. You see it is actually trying to run. Like maybe I don't have it quite hot enough or do I still have some resistance in there because of that Bubba brass piston that is rubbing and looks like it was beat up with a 16 ounce ball peen hammer. I'll never understand that. More likely Bubba's been dead since 1941. Almost ready to run isn't it? Now notice it won't run at all going the other way. There's quite a bit of resistance there. Now that's pretty warm there and we don't really want heat there. And on the other end it's warm but I assume that we have some flow now going through the radiator but that's just an assumption. There should be. It's thermosiphon. I think I talked about that. All right, be back in a few more minutes where, after I fiddle around a bit more. Okay, I'm dazed and confused. It's 15 minutes later, and now it doesn't seem to run quite as well as it did a few minutes ago. And here's what I do not understand. It's quite warm right here. Too hot for me to hold my hand on. Same thing here. Why isn't the water circulating and cooling that. Now it's warm all the way up to here about up to this point and then it's ice cold right there because it's let's see it's uh, 60 degrees here in the garage. Same thing at the bottom here that that's that's quite cold and that's kind of warm, so there does not seem to be the circulation that I would have suspected. And remember, after the whole thing heats up, we can't really expect it to run. Well, there it's a little bit better again for no good reason. All right. I had a little bit of success today. But I'm still kind of discouraged, but a little more enthused than I was when I started. Remember that we have a little bit of head pressure here from this 36 inch stand pipe going up to the fuel line. I see I got some white gas coming down here. So there's just all kinds of minor issues that I need to deal with. And I was thinking about ending the video right now for good, but I think we'll have one more session tomorrow and then 
I'm pretty well sick of it. Be sure and go back and look at my Sterling engine videos. I've got a lot of them. I'll put a list of them in the description for people that are interested in that. But you know, it, it really wants to run like a Briggs and Stratton that is kind of fussy. And I'm not getting any more heat out of this. That's it. Boy, that's too hot to touch. A little bit too hot to touch. And over here, yeah, I, I can't hold my hand on it by any means. And I have plenty of oil on the piston, even though I've taken the oiler out and still have the green plug in place. Leave comments if you have constructive ones, but I'll end it for this session, but the video is not over. I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to, going, I'm going to turn it off is what I'm going to do. It's time for beans anyway. See you later.